Final game week of the season. How's prep going with the team? Prep's really good. I think there's definitely a different tone to this. Kids who've been around here for a while can understand what it means when they're playing the Vandals. Uh, but from my vantage point, I continue to always point it back at us that if you if you find an opponent that you are really excited to play, that needs to show in your preparation and your work ethic and your attention to detail. And you know our guys are you know it's funny just to see guys nicked up at this point, but man, they're still rallying, and that's something that gets you really excited about the game week. It's with well, nicks, bruises, uh, all, all sorts of different ailments, but man, those guys are excited to come to work. Uh, it was our last padded practice for a lot of the seniors today, so they're carrying them off the field and. Uh, we're going to do our best. It's all mental from here on out, uh, but a lot of preparation still needs to take place for us to get ready to go. So the last couple weeks, maybe um, you have that game against Weber and then this game against UC Davis. The defense has really kind of stepped up a little bit and been limiting teams a lot, but the offense maybe quite isn't where it was at uh, early in the season. So where does the preparation kind of look like from an offensive standpoint? Yeah, I, I think for us a lot of it is ball security. I mean, if you look at how those drives against Davis stalled out, I mean, they were turnovers. Same thing against Weber. I mean, Weber, we handed them ten points. You know, we handed them ten points. And you know, even if you count the onside kick that we gave up, that's basically a turnover that led to a 14-point turnaround for Weber. And then at Davis, I mean, you just, you, we had you were up a touchdown. We had momentum going, and then we snapped it over the the tailback's head. We had momentum, and then we threw a pick on the first play. I mean, the, it's just being able to manage the moments and understand that just putting the ball in play is okay and that no matter how much you want to make a play ball security is always paramount um, that, that that's coaching that's playing and we're all involved in that but I'm I mean we've moved it fine against two of the better defenses in the conference if you look at the average yards that those teams are giving up compared to what we were able to do against them I was proud of the effort that the guys gave but details it comes down to just a few plays a game every game and uh, when you when you put the ball on the turf and scoring position it's gonna be tough to win Cody, you're playing Idaho this week, and there's a few parallels uh, between your situation and Jay Eck last year coming in, uh, taking over the Vandals, but how would you compare, I, I realize this is probably a complicated answer, but how would you compare where your program is with where Idaho was last year? Yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of, I would say our programs are really different. Just, uh, I mean, if you look at funding, facilities, tradition, I mean, they're, they're different programs. I mean, you're going to recruit from different areas. And, you know, even, I mean, Bobby Petrino had won some games there. I mean, Idaho always had really talented teams that would hang in there in games. And I think Idaho's issue was they would lose close games. And that was a frustrating thing for a lot of those fans. And then you bring in a guy with a national championship pedigree in Jason Eck, who'd been at one of the best FCS programs. Having a guy that knows what it looks like at the elite level, like South Dakota State, um, a guy who's that good of a person, that good of a coach, to go into a program that's really built to win. I mean, Idaho, from a recruiting standpoint, their budget standpoint, what they pay their coaches, what their facilities are like, those guys are ready to win. So they got a guy who knew what it took, and they came in and were ready to rock and roll and have done a great job. Uh, for us, I think there are a lot of other things administratively that we're still building. And, man, you have to be really pleased with the progress that Pauline and uh, – President Satterley were able to make over the last couple years, and we're building there. I wouldn't say we're ready-made blue sky blue chip right now, but we're making positive strides, and that's the stuff that makes you really excited. Um, you know, last year they had a three-win improvement, and people thought that they won the Super Bowl. You know, we had a, at least right now, it's a two-win improvement. We'd love to get to a three-win improvement this weekend, but I hope the parallels are that regardless of what the on-field results are, it just feels different. You know, I feel like. Uh, Coach Eck really came in and connected with the fans and connected with the players, and that's what every coach is trying to do. You want to make sure that the community knows you're proud to represent them and you're going to work really hard for them and that your players are excited about representing that university. And He did that last year, and I, I hope that at the end of this year we'll be able to say we did the same. What are the, the three most important things you have to do to take this program to the next level? Yeah, we have to uh, maximize our scholarship equivalency so we can actually have the 63 uh, – Foles allocated, have 85 guys on scholarship. Um, we're working at that. Pauline has done some stuff with the university, moving budgets around, trying to find ways with in-state kids. Uh, because from an equivalency standpoint, Idaho State has never really gotten to that point. You know, you look at uh, the Dakota States, that's the extreme example. They, I mean, they're maxing out their equivalency every year. They don't care what the budget is. They're maxing it out. And for us, when you're playing down 13, 14 scholarship players, that makes a difference. That's that's a string. That's another opportunity for a difference maker. And in the past, they haven't. You got to have a full time staff. I mean, for us, it, I think key continuity is really important. And I remember, you know, use the Idaho example. We, uh, 
I'm not going to say who he was, but there was a coach at Idaho who we were talking to when I was at my previous institution, um, and they were making 40 grand per position more than we were making in California. So I mean, they were paying guys a lot. I'm not saying we're going to pay people at that level, but we got to have at the FCS level. You can have 14 full-time guys. That means they're getting benefits, and we got to get there. Um, the retention rate's important, and you can't have your DFO also coaching special teams and your linebackers coach also, uh, you know, handling all the internal operations, right? Um, you want them coaching linebackers. And so I think if we can max out the full staff and do enough for those guys to keep them here, I believe in our coaching staff and think the continuity will really help grow, especially if you look at the amount of returners that we're going to have next year, barring a mass exodus in the portal, which I don't anticipate. The second thing is we really got to pour into the, the weight room. And uh, I, I say Coach Pittman. Um, right now, Auburn's paying Coach Pitt. Um, and... I've already been in talks with administrations that we're going to try and do everything we can to keep him here. Obviously, he has the experience and connections that, you know, if somebody else gets a Power 5 job, he's not going to stay. But he likes it. He loves Idaho. He loves Pocatello. He wants to be here, and he really enjoys these kids. He's made so many strides for us. Um, just having somebody dedicated to that development because we, until we are ready-made with elite facilities and a winning pedigree, you need to develop kids. Um, you, you can't just – you're not going to find good players, and you can't count on a diamond in the rough every time. You got to make your culture. You got to make your players, and I think Coach Pittman's going to do that. But we have to make sure that he he gets taken care of, and we got to. The next thing is renovating the weight room. I, I said I love Holt Arena; it is a gem. But we get Holt Arena for four months a year. You know that weight room is every day 365, and that's a big recruiting thing. Says man, if I come here, a new arena is not going to make you a better player. A new weight room. I've renovated weight room. Even though the weights weigh the same, I mean, the weights in our room are the same as the ones at USC and Ohio State. But I th it shows that, man, you're investing in making their everyday experience a quality one. And I really believe our administration is doing that. We're making strides in all of these areas. I'm not poo-pooing it, but a lot of these things aren't going to happen overnight. President Satterley and uh, Pauline Theros have done a wonderful job. We still have a lot of room to make up. Uh, I have that goal in sight, but I'm going to be happy with what we have and just continue to focus on incremental improvements every day. And I hope whoever the new president can kind of pick up that baton and really go. Uh, that'll be really important for us to continue to progress as a football program. Just one follow-up question. Yeah. You talk about uh, scholarship equivalencies. How many equivalents do you have now? Uh, we're at 71 right now, okay. um, and 85 is the limit. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. you do the math. Yeah. <laughs> Cody, uh, you know, for the Idaho game, They've got an excellent quarterback. They have one of the top receivers in the com in the uh, conference, maybe in the nation at the FCS level, and they have one of the best running backs. Assuming he plays yeah. Saturday as a coach, how do you defend that? Do you try to take something away? The Bill Belichick philosophy: you you could beat us with something else, or do you just try and defend everything and do the best that you can? Yeah. Well, you know, if if you try and stop everything, you aren't going to stop anything. I think that's kind of how defense goes. But what you can do as a coach is you put yourself in their shoes and you try and find out situationally based on tendencies by formation, down and distance. It's not really a guessing game, but you're going to kind of take away what they do best in those situations. So in passing situations, you're going to have to either confuse McCoy or double Hatton. Um, obviously, they've both been incredible. And then find times when they're really trying to control the game, you have to find ways to not only put numbers in the box but change the front so the O-line can't get after you. I mentioned Kochek has done such a good job running the ball everywhere he's been. He's obviously an offensive line guy, and he's a genius. But, you know, you have to change the looks with the front as well and where, where those extra fits are coming from, from our secondary, just so we don't give them the same picture every time. Otherwise, they're going to dial up some play-action shots. And when you load the box, you have to make sure that your corners are able to eliminate the big play. Each, each receiver kind of has routes that they specialize in. And so really reading the game plan, all right, if I'm one-on-one, -on -one, how am I going to play 80? If I'm one-on-one, -on -one, how am I going to play number one? If I'm one-on-one, -on -one, how am I going to play zero? I mean, we got to be clued into all of those things. They're as, they're as talented as you get at the at the FCS level, um, they've done a great job up front. Man, they're, those skilled players are legitimate, so it'll be quite the test for us. Um, and those guys are going to try and shorten the game, so you're not going to get as many opportunities. Uh, they do a great job managing their, their home field. How do you feel about your quarterback situation? And going forward, how do you feel about maintaining the two-quarterback system? Yeah, it's, it's not ideal to have to play two all the time, but I've said that they both have varying skill sets. I think you've probably seen some areas show up maybe later in the season where 
if you would have gone all in on one of the guys, maybe a little bit more experience would have helped them. Just uh, I don't know if we're hindering their development in any ways because we do, we do so much there. But I, I would love to try and spend some time in the offseason really pushing these guys and figure out, hey, who's going to be our guy? And we got some other guys on the roster too. Um, you know, it remains to be seen what uh, Cavallero in, ends up doing. He was a guy that his injury kind of took him out of it uh, this year. And um, then Jackson Sharman, I mean, that kid's coming. And if you guys have been in practice, that kid's a talented too, and he wants it. So the great thing about college football, especially this program here, is we're, gonna, we're into developing kids. We're going to develop relationships with them, and we're going to develop them as players. And now that we kind of know what the bar is, we, we can try and raise it for each of those guys and see how far each of them can go. Um, Everybody's always going to be welcome here. You're not going to you're not going to ship kids off, but the reality is, it's I mean, it's the big sky. We got to continue to compete and um, put those guys through the fire a little bit to see who can rise to the top. Because I think we're going to have a talented team returning next year. We don't have a lot of seniors. Those seniors, we're going to do our best to replace, and uh, a couple positions need to get fortified in the off season. But a lot of those positions, you are excited about the talent you have in that room and what you're going to have coming back. So we just got to develop and mold those guys starting uh, the day after the Idaho game, and not wait until spring ball to figure out what we got. Kind of on the subject of back to parallels between Idaho and Idaho State. Not to get too controversial here, but how do you think the Kibbe Dome compares to Holt Arena? <laughs> well. I always think it's funny when people bring up that argument because there really is no argument. I mean, I think Holt Arena is far superior to the Kibbe Dome in every way. You know, I, I love uh, love a lot of guys on that Vandal coaching staff. They got good people, but man, you got to respect Holt Arena. That that's a cut above. I think, especially looking at what people have done. I say it in a, in a non-joking way. I mean, if you go into the arena, I mean this. This is a nice place. It doesn't feel like there's an aircraft carrier. It's Some of it's tight. I get the ceiling is smaller here, but that makes it intimate and really cool. You know, you don't need to be able to fly a plane into your football field. You need to be able to play football on it. And we can do that in Holt Arena. I think the colors in here are better. Um, it's well lit. I love the bright ceiling. Um, it's a fantastic place to play football, and our guys are lucky to have this as their home venue. Cody, again, like with Brad, we're going to try and do something to, to wrap the season up next week. So with respect, how would you sum up this season for you personally, regardless as to what happens Saturday? I mean, you have at least three wins in the bank, which is more than they've had in the last few years. Yeah. And you, you said since day one it's, it's about building something and it's about a progression. How would you sum up this season for you? I mean, from a wins and losses standpoint, nobody's ever going to stand on top of their car and put both their fists above their head and scream in elation at three wins. And you shouldn't. But like I said, my, my mission here, I mean, we, we're so far away from talking about winning a bunch of games. You know, when you're uh, when you're at USC or Tennessee and you're going to take a bunch of transfers because you got everything to sell and all that that tradition in a ready-made program, yeah, you can, you can expect to win right away. For these guys, there are so many massive improvements that we have made that you guys have not seen, whether it's the, you know, Coach Pittman, who you've seen around, the first-time full-time strength coach, the nutrition, um, our nutrition being the best in the big sky now. Now, we've been doing it for six months. We'll see if we can maintain it for six years, but that'll be a really important part of our, our growth here. And those kids feel a difference. Um, I think the chemistry on the team, looking at the uh, – between the guys that are still here, uh, the guys that are still hanging out with each other, just being around the team at practice. I think the people who've been here consistently say it feels better. And that's kind of the first step because anytime you go into a renovation project, sometimes you have to do some excavation. It's not always just onward, right? You don't just buy a plot of land and start building a house. Sometimes you gotta lay the foundation. You gotta dig it out a little bit and figure out what it looks like. But for those guys, the reality, I mean, we're in the SEC of the FCS, and three Big Sky wins has happened three times since I graduated high school. So we can poo-poo it and say we want it better. Well, what were you expecting? Do you think that we've had bad players and bad coaches and bad administration for 20 years? I don't think that anybody can totally shoulder the blame for any of that. But we have a wonderful community here that's going to support football. And it's my job to continue to battle for Idaho State and battle for the kids and try to make those incremental improvements every day. And with the momentum and inertia that's been created this season, I hope we can carry it because it's not going to get easier. The bar has been set every day that those kids are going to have the hardest offseason they've ever had in their life. Last year was easy because no, there were no expectations. It's just uh, show up. Well, now I know what you can lift. I know what you can run. I know what you can produce. Let's get better. So it's going to be harder. We're still going to love them and continue to try and 
make it a joyful experience for them. But the bar's been set, and now the great part of athletics is continuing to push yourself and test yourself. And with the full cycle in it, we kind of know what everybody's capable of. Um, the administration is continuing to make strides, which I really appreciate. Um, they've been incredible, um, but we still got to go further. Our coaching staff has done a good job, but it's not just about loving up on the kids anymore. We got to be better coaches. We got to take what we did this fall, find out the shortcomings in our meetings, in our recruitment, in our teaching and make those better. Um, so I'm really excited to attack it. That's the greatest part about athletics is just getting better. And for the first year, for us, it's kind of about laying the foundation, figuring out which way is up and just keeping all the kids here. And so far the retention looks good. It remains to be seen. Um, but I'm really excited about attacking this off season and uh, continuing to grow this thing. Coach, we're still committed to the 3-3-5 three, three, defensively? Yeah, I, I think 3-3-5 uh, three, three, five, five is great. You want to be a little bit more multiple from a front standpoint. But Coach Runda knows that. I mean, he, he can he can coach anything. Just, I mean, even if you look at me, I mean, traditionally where I've been, I mean, I came from a 12 personnel run the football team. I mean, we coached the leading rusher in history at UC Davis and had a lot of other really good tight ends and players there. But what is going to work here? It starts with being a little bit more simple so the guys can play fast. Because when you're when you say you're not winning at the elite level, you want to make sure the kids aren't coming in and having to learn a new playbook every day. You want them to see improvement, so you need to have carryover and technique and techniques and scheme. Uh, and then as going into the offseason, I mean, our defensive line is loaded. I mean, we got really good players in that room, and they're all coming back. So we got to make sure, hey, let's get our best players on the field. Does it mean we're going to be a 3 3 5 team? Most of the time, probably, but still, whether it's getting into even or bare fronts and short yardage and goal line situations, that's absolutely something that we're going to attack, explore, and implement. And the same thing for us is, I, I mean, we need to get better at running the football if you're going to win more. You absolutely do. And we looked at the games where probably the games we quote unquote should have won, we ran the ball more. And I mean, both games, we got guys hurt for multiple weeks, which stinks, but it's a physical thing. So we don't even, we need to develop the, the offensive line and running backs that we have here. I love running the football when you can do it well. Our guys have battled and learned, and they're going to continue to grow. And the seniors that we do lose, we're going to pour a ton of money into the fronts on both sides of the ball because that's where you see massive improvement. You know, uh, is it's, it's easy to go from being awful to being respectable. Now we need to just get better. And hey, win, losing close games is better than losing games in blowouts, but winning those games is nice too. So you got to be able to own the line of scrimmage a little bit more in those situations, and we're going to make sure we do that in the offseason. What's your recruiting breakdown look like as far as portal versus JC versus freshman? Like I said, the, the portal thing's always interesting just because for us, I say in the portal, you know, half those guys are not really trying to go play somewhere. They're guys who quit and are like, well, I'll keep my options open, you know. Um, and then a lot of those guys are looking to move up. And when you're looking to move up, you know, a kid from, you know, some Division II institution is probably not going to come here and be like, wow, what a step up. Um, you might, and that's where a lot of the throwing the football and the 3-3-5 goes into, some of that's marketing, you know. I mean, we don't want to recruit 12 receivers every offseason, but the kids that know we're throwing it, you're hoping you get better ones. You know, you only mean, only mean to take one or two, but you're going to get a little bit more firepower because of what you've put on tape and on paper, like this is what we're going to do. Now, we're not going to throw 57 times every game going forward. We're always going to be a passing team. But uh, the, the breakdown for me is finding the best fit who can make an impact mixed with the development piece. I still think we're going to have better luck getting tough, long, local kids and developing over the course of three years than trying to win every game every year and just hoping that you can buy one-year players. That's not in our mold. That's not what I'm about. That's not what we're going to have success with. I'd say for us, we're probably going to be a little bit more JC than we will in the portal, just because those kids are kind of hungry for an opportunity. And a lot of the portal guys are either problems, looking to move up, um, or looking for a, a better, nicer situation, um, or to get closer to home. And we don't really fit a lot like we fit the scheme thing. Maybe it's a really good receiver who wasn't getting the touches he wants, and they see Jaden James catching 90 balls, and you go, man, I want to go there. Um, you know, maybe on defense, a safety, you, hey, I'm a backup one high safety, but I want to play. Well, we got three of them. We, we see a skill set that we can utilize, and we're going to come after you. But uh, I'd say you always want to get more incoming kids. I say recruit more high schoolers than you do transfer kids. I don't know exactly what that mix is because I can't – I mean, I've been doing it for a year now, Brad. I'm not a veteran. But I think you want more high school kids than you have transfers. I don't know if that's 60-40 or 70-30. Um, 
And then for us, we'll always, always probably lean more at least 60 to 40 JC to transfer until we get points over. If you got a palace for a weight room and we have all these things and these coaches have been here for a long time, so you can develop relationships with kids that, hey, you may go to you may go to Boise State, but I recruited you out of high school and now you're not playing at Boise State, so you want to come here. You have talented local kids who don't know us. They didn't know us coming out of high school. So even if you get a steal, well, a lot of those are kind of guys that you fall back to. Um, and so it's a, it'll be a unique situation that we'll continue to navigate, but I'm, I'm excited about doing it. And um, I'm excited about the guys we have here too. Cody, what areas would you be looking to try and bolster next year in your recruiting? Just from a numbers standpoint, it's the offensive line and the, the secondary. Because our defensive line is loaded and legit. we got a lot of good linebackers and run us coaching the heck out of them. Our, our secondary is super talented, but, you know, every time Calvin Pitcher or Mason Young goes out, you're like, oh, because we're, we're about one, we're one pulled hammy away from me playing safety, you know? <laughs> um, and then at offensive line, a lot of the things, you know, Brad was standing down there with the offensive line, and we've got eight or nine guys down there, you know, so we need just sheer numbers. Because we, you know, last year, we don't have a single guy here that played offensive line last year with the exception of Jaden Garcia. And Jaden Garcia played in four games to try and keep his red shirt, but Mike had never played on line before. Oh, sorry, Jacob had. Um, but, yeah, really for the majority of the year, you're playing with Jorgen, a true freshman, Mike, who's kind of a weird hybrid of true freshman slash old man senior because he never played a line before. And then with Vinny and Alex, um, just having never played Division One football, it's like you're playing with four freshmen. Um, so we want to get some – those guys are going to continue to develop, but we need to get some guys behind them too because those seniors are leaving. we got some other guys that probably haven't played as much as they want. That It's hard It's hard to stay for six years and use your COVID year if you're a lineman not playing because – Practicing as a quarterback is a joy. You just play catch the whole time. Practicing as an offensive lineman, it's a fist fight every day. So it's a little bit harder to manage. But um, offensive line, secondary. Okay. Those are them. Cody, when this all started back in August, I think I asked you a question along the lines of, so far has things met your expectations? When you look at this year and you think back when you have some time next week or in two weeks after Thanksgiving, did it meet your expectations? Not only this program but being a head coach uh being a head coach is awful um, <laughs> as he says with a straight face yeah uh no it's being here has been an awesome experience uh i think it's it's surpassed my expectations but also met them i mean i have high expectations for myself i have high expectations for the people i work with and coming in, I think these guys got better. I thought they got closer together. I think if you were looking at the schedule before the year, even if you're being optimistic, pointing at, hey, these are the games that we're going to win, I think we either matched that or exceeded that. And every year is going to be a brand new year. So, hey, I appreciate the strides the administration's making, but what you did last June to help us out is not going to be good enough because I know we just did that. Let's get better. Just like if we sit back here and we win three games next year, you're going to say, hey, Cody, that's not good enough. You know, I mean, we all got to get better. And we had a talk at our quarterback club lunch last Thursday of, you know, the, des the desire to be awesome. And if you really want something, you better invest time and money and effort into it. So if we want to surpass these other schools, I need to compete my butt off to out-recruit them. Our kids need to out-train them. But our administration and our coaches, need we need to out-coach them. We need to out-support our guys. You know, I mean, everything is a competition. You compete 365 days a year for 11 games, maybe more. You can't just compete on – if you just compete on Saturday, you're going to get your butt kicked. So everybody involved with Idaho State, including community members, boosters, guys on our team, coaches, staff, we got to push to get better. Whatever we did last year is not good enough if you want to get better. So uh, last year UC Davis beats Idaho. Uh, so we're kind of – you have some experience with Jason Eck and playing against the Vandals. We're kind of the keys to the game this Saturday. Yeah, um, like I said, I think uh, when we were at Davis, it was the largest loss that Eck has had at Idaho. Um, and a big part of that is I thought our guys came and played out with energy. We scored on the first drive, kind of put them behind the eight ball. I think they were excited about the playoffs um, in a similar situation to this, where at Davis we were we were fighting to get into the playoffs. We didn't make it, but we had a heck of a run. Um, we were fighting to get in, I think they were just ready to get there. So... On one hand, you're like, hey, it's a similar situation, but they also got bit in the butt last year and it hurt them. So they're going to be ready to rock and roll this year. Um, 
you know, I think uh, just at, at Davis, we had never lost to Idaho. Um, and I, they know that and preach that. I think they respect us probably more than they have, just looking at the work that our, our kids have done. But, man, I mean, they, they're going to try and beat us by 100 because Eck is a great dude, but he also keeps receipts. I mean, he's he's going to he, – I mean, he knows he's going to put up – I mean, even if we're a different team than we were last year, he's probably going to show them that stuff because they didn't play Davis this year. And this is his first shot at revenge from that. And he did, he did – I mean, that guy, all he does when bad things happen is they go back to the drawing board and they get better. And – if they're healthy, they're extremely lethal. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the Woods kid you mentioned, he, he's probably the most talented back in the conference, not named Lane Larison. Um, I think those two receivers, that combo, I mean, he took them both to media day because both those kids had power five opportunities and they stayed in Moscow, which says a lot to that community there for doing what it takes to keep those kids there. I mean, those kids feel happy, loved, and supported because there are a lot of kids that in years past would not be at the Big Sky School for two years in a row after that type of production. And then that quarterback, too, he had, you don't think that kid had offers to go places? I mean, they're, those kids at, at, in Moscow, I mean, they're they're appreciated, they're supported, and those guys are going to come out and play their butts off. And it's not because it's Idaho State. It's not because I was at Davis last year and we beat them. It's because those guys believe in Eck, and we're trying to instill that same confidence in our guys. I think we've seen it. Uh, now we just got to continue to push and uh, recruit and develop to the point where our, our rosters is um, in a similar situation to theirs. But, man, we got good players, and I like some matchups, and I like the funk that we're going to bring on O&D uh, this week. It'll give us some advantages, but we got to come out and play four quarters of good football, and we can't put it on the turf in the red zone, and we'll be okay. ISU just announced an NIL uh, uh, organization last week, and I haven't had a chance to really explore that. What does that mean for your program? I, I uh, honestly, um, I, I don't know exactly the the potential that lies in that, that, that and, I, and not in a positive or negative way. Um, it remains to be seen. I haven't, I don't know the numbers. Uh, I don't know if any of our kids are getting anything yet. I know there's interest in it. And as a college football program that's trying to take care of your athletes, the NIL thing is going to be important. Um, just because those kids want, they, they want to live quality lives. It's not that kids want to make money. It's not that they want to wear jewelry or Jordans or, you know, live in a palace. It's just, hey, it's nice when you don't have to eat ramen noodles the last month, you know, last week of the month. Um, it's nice when people are selling your jerseys and you can make some money off of it. You know, there are people walking around in number one jerseys, and I don't know if Josh has seen a single penny from it. Um, but Josh Alford works really hard. I, you know, would love for him uh, to make minimum wage with his football hours, and I know he does it. Um, but we'll... Uh, we'll see where it goes. I, I know we have a strong community here. That's one of the things that Idaho State really has. It's... Uh, it's kind of ace in the hole is how much Pocatello really supports the football program and how much people care here. So it'll be interesting to see if our guys reap any benefits from that. I don't, I don't know from a compliance standpoint. I mean, we can't endorse it or do anything for our kids. I think the NCAA is going to vote on trying to change that. But uh, it'll, be a, it'll be an interesting tool for keeping kids here. But if you're trying to get into the attracting market and recruiting kids with that stuff, that money's silly being thrown around. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> I think I think we got to get people here and, Treat we got to treat them with substance. We've got to recruit them with substance, meaning quality people, quality program, quality development, relationships, actuals of improvements happening around here. Um, we're gonna, and then you can help keep kids with that. But recruiting kids, I think uh, that's. I mean, we're gonna be giving everybody new cars anytime soon, like the University of Utah or in Boise State. All those guys that are on billboards, like that's a different deal. Um, if somebody wanted to come poach one of our guys with legitimate money, they're gonna be able to do it. So we gotta we gotta take care of them with substance and all the other stuff that matters.